the first uh, epistle of the Apostle Paul to the church of Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to read the opening part, the first 11 verses, and then we're going to go back a few chapters to read a verse from chapter 9. But first of all then, 1 Corinthians 15. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. And then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach. And so you believed. And just turn back a couple of pages in your Bible to chapter 9. Chapter 9. And verse 16. 1 Corinthians 9, 16. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Let's bow together in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have ordained for us this place and these means of grace. We thank you, Lord, that you meet with us here, really and truly. We thank you, Lord, that you minister to us here through that which you have ordained for the good of our souls. It is grace that, Lord, we need, and it is grace that is ministered to us. Lord, we are but the recipients. We say in the words of the Gospel of John that of his fullness of all we receive, grace upon grace. And we think again, too, of the words in the epistle of James that he gives more grace. And we stand, Lord, today, every one of us, no matter where who we are or what we've been through in the past week or what we are facing in the future, in the week that lies ahead of us in the will of God, Lord, we are in need of that grace. And we are assured, Lord, we thank you for this, that your grace is sufficient for us. And no matter, Lord, what we're facing, whether it be internal struggle or external difficulty, Lord, we thank you that you have promised that you are there and that you will never leave us or forsake us and that you will impart to us, Lord, everything that we need. So we bless you, Lord Jesus, today for the fullness that is in yourself. We come today to thank you, and we come to hear from you, and we come to receive from you. And, O oh Lord, today there are many here today who are facing difficult times, unusual circumstances, and we pray for them. We lift them up before you. We think especially of our brother Fred today and all that he is going through and facing and the circumstances that are there. Lord, we pray that as you know and as you will, that you will have mercy in that situation. We thank you, our God, that you are Lord, that you are over all things, and that, Lord, you are day in all things, not only for the glory of your great name, but, Lord, for the good of your own people. And so, Lord, we come to you today. We sit at your feet and give us a heart, Lord, of Mary, who sat at Jesus' feet and listened to his word. Open up, Lord, our ears internally, and we would say with young Samuel, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And we pray that, Lord, we will receive with meekness this engrafted word that is able to save our souls. For we ask it in our Saviour's name 
And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Well, it is well known to you that before our Saviour, who rose from the dead, ascended to sit at the right hand of his Father in heaven, he gave what we call a commission, the Great Commission, to his disciples who were with him on that occasion. A commission that was not only given personally to them, and it was, but through them, has been given throughout the centuries and millennia to the entire Church of God. And that commission was go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Our commission, beloved, is a commission, and it is a commission to preach. The word preach is generally in Scripture a word that is used for the declaration that is made by a herald. Now, back in the old days, a herald was one who was appointed by a king who when he wanted his laws and decrees to be made known would give them to the herald who would go out into the public places and cry out. In the old uh, English system they, they were sometimes called town criers and they would go out uh, dressed in the uh, uniform of their office and they would ring the bell and they would proclaim what the law was, what the will of the king was what his latest laws were with regard to them. And that, of course, was a great privilege to be commissioned by the king, to be a herald of the king. It, it was that to which they had been called. It was that to which they had been uh, appointed. Uh, and they spoke, therefore, with the authority of the king when they went forth. And it's important to know that when they went forth, it wasn't their own words that they were to speak. It wasn't their own wisdom that they were to give. It wasn't their own opinions that they were to expound. It was to be the word and only the word that had been given to them to speak by the king. And so it is with us. You and I have this glorious privilege, this joyful responsibility of having been commissioned by the king of kings and lord of lords. Let me just say by way of an aside that this is a commission that is not only given to the pastors of the Church of Jesus Christ. It is their commission and they feel in it if they do not preach as God has commanded them to preach. But we discover in the New Testament that this is a commission that is given, yes, to those who bear the office of ministers of the word. But it is given to every child of God. We have been likewise called upon, commissioned by the Lord, and thereby privileged by him to this honor of going forth with his word. Let us never for one moment, brethren and sisters, look upon the commission as something that is an onerous chore, a kind of burdensome task that we would rather not do. This is a privilege indeed to which the Lord has called us. And, of course, as we think not only of the commission, we think of the content, therefore. What is the content of this message that we are to go forth as heralds to proclaim? Well, it is very clear to us we are to preach what the Lord Jesus called the gospel. It is the good news. And uh, that and that alone it is to be our message to the world in which we live. And you ask the question this morning, well, what is the gospel? Well, of course, we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 because this is the apostolic gospel defined for us by the apostle Paul himself. A message which he received, he said, from the Lord was not given to him, was not transmitted to him by anyone else. It was received directly from the Lord. And incidentally, he repeats that very same fact when he writes to the Galatians. And he reminds them that when he spoke to them, when he preached the gospel to them, was not something that he received from man, but that which he received from the Lord. And it was nothing else than the gospel. It was the good news. Friends, this morning, if we were to go out into this world to proclaim only bad news, then it would be indeed a tremendously burdensome task. But oh, thank God today we have been commissioned by God as his heralds with the privilege, with the joyful calling of going out to proclaim good news 
to the world the best of news. And what is that gospel? Well, let us never forget what the gospel is. Paul says what it is in this chapter that we read from 1 Corinthians 15. It is the gospel of how Christ, there it is, it's the gospel of Christ. It's a message about a person. It's a message that has a person as its central, as its central theme. We do not go out to preach philosophies. We do go out to preach opinions. We do go out to spread ideas. We go out into this world to, to talk about a person. And that person is none other than the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, our God and our Savior. But it is even more particular than that. It is not only the gospel which is about Christ, it is the gospel which is about a cross. Notice how it's emphasized in 1 Corinthians 15 when he says, Christ died for our sins. That's the cross. That's Calvary. That's what's at the very center of our message. That's what Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 when he talked about the preaching of the cross. And so when we're preaching the gospel, let us be clear, we're preaching about Christ. We're talking to men and women about who he was. We're talking to about men and women as to why he came. We're talking to men and women about the glorious offices that he fulfilled. But we're also talking to men and women about the death that he died. We're coming particularly to this message of the cross. And what was the cross? The cross was the place upon which our Jesus suffered. Yes, we know that. But many suffered upon crosses in the days of the Roman Empire. What was particular about this cross? What was unique about this terrible death outside the walls of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago? Well, it was unique in two senses. It was unique in that it was a death that was vicarious. What does that mean? The word vicarious comes from the word vicar, which literally means to be a substitute. A vicar is a substitute. And our Lord Jesus Christ's death was a substitutionary death. That is to say he died in the place of, in the room of, in the stead of others who ought to have died. That, friends, is right at the very center of the gospel. And that not only emphasizes the uniqueness of our Lord Jesus' death, but it also tells us something about the fact that this death was not merely in terms of its suffering, in terms of its pain, in terms of its anguish. It was not something that was merely physical. It was all of that. Our Lord Jesus Christ suffered horrendous pain upon the cross of Calvary in his body. He physically endured that pain, but he felt more than that. The Bible tells us in the prophecy of Isaiah about the suffering of his soul. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Lord to crush him. And so he was suffering both in body and soul. And he was suffering as a substitute on behalf of others. He was suffering what they ought to have suffered. And therefore, brothers and sisters, this morning, he was suffering nothing less than the pains of hell on the cross of Calvary. He was suffering the wrath of God, the just wrath of God that our sins deserved. And this cross was not only vicarious, a substitutionary death on behalf of others who should have received the penalty that he was enduring. But this morning let us understand it was a victorious death. A victorious death, you say? Hanging there in shame, hanging there in ignominy and reproach and disgrace, Hanging there, bearing, as it were, the curse, for the scripture says, Cursed is every one that hangs upon a tree, but come near to that cross with me this morning. And listen to the words that he spoke as he hung there in agony and pain and in shame. And listen as his dying breath he declares these words, It is finished. It is finished. What is meant by that? What was Jesus referring to when he said it is finished? 
What he was saying is this, the price that the law of God demanded because of your sin and mine had been fully, finally, forever paid. It's done. Unless we should have any question about the victorious nature of his death, the fact that he did accomplish all that the Father gave him to do, then go three days later to that tomb and hear the words, he is risen from the dead. He has come forth from the dead because his work to save was a completed work. It was a finished work. It was a work that satisfied the law of God. It was a work that pleased the Father. And we know that his work was victorious because God raised him from the dead. That is the message that we go out into the world with. Friends, today may God grant that I and you may never depart from this glorious good news. That we may never substitute the message of the gospel for another gospel. Alas, today in churches that even profess and confess as far as their confessions are concerned, an evangelical statement of faith when the pulpit is, is focused upon, when the preacher gets into the pulpit, it is not this gospel that men and women hear. It is not the good news that are brought to bear upon the conscience and the minds of men under the burden and weight and guilt of their sin and struggling against the powers of darkness. Oh, there is a multitude of false gospels that are preached today with the name of Jesus attached to it. Just to make it sound a little bit Christian, but it's not the apostolic gospel. The gospel of moralism. And the gospel of materialism. The gospel of mysticism. I don't care what they are. They are all di divergent forms of a distortion of this true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ which focuses our attention with a laser-like focus upon the person of Jesus Christ and all that he did in his life and death and resurrection for sinners. The commission, the content of the commission, the company that are to hear this message that we preach going into all the world and preach the gospel to who? To every creature. This is, a, this is a gospel that all need to hear because it's a gospel that all need. This is the good news that men and women in their sin need to, need to have brought to, to bear upon their minds day by day as often as they can, as often as we can. It's a gospel for the rich and the poor, for the high and the low, for the ignorant and for the literate and for the wise. And listen to me this morning. It's a gospel that not only do those who are unbelieving need to hear. It's a gospel that we as Christians need to hear again and again and again. Because friends this morning, please understand this. This gospel proclaimed, this word of the cross, as Paul calls it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, because it is the very word of God, Paul calls it the gospel of God, it must therefore be a word of power. It must be a word that actually effects something, that does something, that produces something. Remember what the word of God can do. Was it not by the very word of God that the heavens were made and all the host of them? That's what the psalmist tells us very clearly. He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Listen, for God to bring something to pass, he only has to speak. And look through the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ in the days of his flesh. And look how often was the case that he merely spoke and it was done. And whether it was casting out demons, whether it was stilling a storm, whether it was curing a disease, the word of the Lord was with power. And friends, this morning, the word of the Lord still has power. We need to understand today that we do not need anything else. We don't need anything else to complement or supplement the preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because it is the preaching of this word in its purity and simplicity that God uses to effect great things, mighty things, miraculous things. 
Isaiah chapter 55. My word shall not return to me void. My word shall not return to me empty, in other words. It shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Friends, this is, this is the word of the gospel. It's, it's a word of power. You know, people are running around today in evangelical churches like headless chickens, wondering today what new thing they can do to try and, as it were, meet the needs and become relevant to people that are sitting in the few. I'll tell you what people need. I'll tell you what's the most relevant thing that men and women can hear. It is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and nothing else. Amen. God forbid that we should be guilty of preaching another gospel or of seeking to add to the gospel or trying to dress up the gospel and make it more pretty and more acceptable for men. The gospel is beautiful in itself. This is the most glorious news that men and women could hear. Any wonder that the, the prophet, and this was repeated by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans, he says, how beautiful are upon the mountains are those who bring the, the good news of the gospel of peace. Here they come and they've got good news for people in darkness, for people whose lives are damaged and destroyed by sin and Satan. They've got good news for people who are dominated by the devil and by the sins of the world. And they step into this darkness and they speak a word of, of, that is good, a word that is liberating, a word of forgiveness, a word of freedom. I don't ever want God give me grace to be guilty of anything else or to be guilty of, of preaching anything else than the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I see myself as having to do here Sunday by Sunday. If others have another message they want to declare, I will readily confess to you, I don't. And I don't want one. The gospel is enough. The gospel is enough. And this word that is a word of power has been placed into the, into the mouths of men. It's God's word, but he puts it into their mouth. And it is through their preaching of that word given by God that God effects great things. God does miraculous and supernatural things. You remember in Ezekiel the story of the vision that Ezekiel saw of a valley filled with dry bones. There were very many, the scripture says, and they were very dry. You look at a situation like that and, uh, you know, Ezekiel was asked the question by the Lord, Son of man, can these bones live? Now, if you had been answering that question, what would you have said? Because everything that was there, everything that you could see, every sense was telling you, this is an impossible situation. They're not only dead, but they're bones. The flesh has corrupted and gone off them long ago. And what is more, they are very dry. Even the bones are starting now to come to the place where they're going into dust as well. And you hear the question, son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel was wise enough to say, Lord, you know and you know through the rest of the story of how God puts words in his mouth. Of God, how God actually tells him what to say to the bones. <laughs> how to preach to bones. There's a good subject in itself. You know, every time that we preach the gospel to the lost, that's what we're doing. We're preaching to bones. We're preaching to people who are dead in trespasses and in sins. Ephesians chapter 2. But notice what the prophet was doing. He was given a commission by the Lord. The Lord put the very words into his mouth that he was to say. And it was nothing to do with the prophet. What accomplished. Except the fact that he was merely the instrument of God. The word was the Lord's. And the power was in the word. And the word was effectual. And you know the rest of the story of how that through that word. That life-giving word, a valley of dry bones, became an exceedingly great army upon its feet. Friends, do you and I believe today that this word that God puts in the mouths of men and women is a word that can do likewise? 
Do we believe in anything else? Let, let it be human philosophy. Let it be the, the opinions that are, that are spoken of in all of our high places of learning. Have those words the same power to do what happened in that valley that Ezekiel stood in. Have those words the power to bring life to the dead. Have those words the power to bring something into existence out of nothing. My friends, this morning, that's the power of the word of the cross. And that word going forth out of my mouth and out of your mouth. Not my word, not your word, his word. The power is in the word, remember that. It is not human power, it's divine power. And it's put into the word and it's preached by men. And it accomplishes what God wants it to accomplish. And it accomplishes great things. The words Jesus said that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And it does not matter, it does not matter one iota how far away from God an individual who hears that word may be. It doesn't matter how deep down they are in the swamp of sin. Listen, this word is a word of power. Now that's not the sermon. Just so as you know. That leads me to want to talk about this thing this morning that we've just referred to, the power of the gospel. More especially to, to think of the practical power of the gospel. Because sometimes when you Make it your purpose, as we have stated ours to be, that I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Sometimes in the minds of Christians, and this is especially true in North America, the idea is, well, that's all right for the sinner. That's okay for the unbeliever. They need to hear that. But I don't need to hear that. I want to hear something, in inverted commas, practical. All right, let's talk about the practical power of the gospel. The practical power of the gospel. Because friends, this morning you will find that there's nothing more practical. There's nothing more down to earth. There's nothing that meets men and women exactly where they are, wherever that may be, than this glorious message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Some time ago, I, I heard of a book which I obtained a copy of. It was, it was written by a, a pastor called uh, Milton Vincent. And he wrote a book called A Gospel Primer for Christians. A Gospel Primer for Christians. It, it's worth getting for many reasons, but even if you read his own personal experience, whereby he came, even as a Christian and even as a pastor, to a fresh realization of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's even, that's even worth reading in itself. You know, I, I rejoice today that there is, among evangelicals, a rediscovery of the gospel. A rediscovery of the preaching of the, the grace of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Milton Vincent, in his book, he makes this point, and I quote, he says, Outside of heaven, the power of God in its highest density is found inside the gospel. This must be so, for the Bible twice describes the gospel as the power of God. Nothing else in all of Scripture is ever described in this way except for the person of Jesus Christ. Such a description indicates that the gospel is not only powerful, but that it is the ultimate entity in which God's power resides and does its greatest work. Indeed, God's power is seen in erupting volcanoes. It is seen in the unimaginably hot boil of our massive sun. It is seen in the lightning spread, our lightning speed of a recently discovered star seen streaking through the heavens at 1.5 million miles an hour. And yet in Scripture, such wonders are never labeled the power of God. 
How powerful then must the gospel be that it should merit such a title? And how great is the salvation it can accomplish in my life? If I would only embrace it by faith and give it a central place in my thoughts every day. The gospel, friends, is the only thing apart from Jesus Christ himself that is described in Scripture as the power of God. And Paul, in the passage that we read to you this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, tells us in verse 3, I delivered unto you as of first importance. Friends, this morning for all men, whether they be believers or no, the gospel of Jesus Christ is of first importance. It's the main thing. And how we as preachers need to be reminded to keep the main thing, the main thing. So I say to you this morning, let's just pause as God's people. Let's just reflect again upon the practical power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me talk to you about three things very simply and maybe very quickly. First of all, I'll talk about the proof of the gospel's power. Secondly, we'll think about the product of the gospel's power. And thirdly, we'll talk about the practice of the gospel's power. How powerful is the gospel? 1 Corinthians 4.15, it's translated a little bit differently in the ESV or NIV from the King James. But in the King James, as Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says to them, I have begotten you through the gospel. What on earth does he mean by that? This word begotten, and you'll find it you know, often in the, in the various uh, lists of names that are given in Scripture. It talks about so-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so begat so-and-so. Literally, it has the thought of giving birth to. What is Paul saying to these Corinthians? I, he says, give birth to you through the gospel. In other words, he says, I came to you people in Corinth and I determined not to know anything among you but Jesus Christ and, and him crucified. And that word that went out of my mouth, God used that to give birth to you. And what's he talking about? He's talking about spiritual birth. He's talking about being born again. He's talking about the great work of regeneration. Notice how he puts it again. I have begotten you through the gospel. This work of regeneration, this work whereby divine life is implanted in the soul of an individual who heretofore was dead in trespasses and in sins, that came about through the gospel. The preaching of the gospel, men and women this morning, is that which God uses to bring life into dead souls. How effective and effectual, therefore, must it be? You know, well, I don't understand it. I don't either. But I know that God has ordained that. And I know that God does that. And I know that, 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 it, that it is always true. Nothing else has this power to bring life into dead souls but that which God calls himself the power of God. In the epistle of James, we read these words, of his own will, he begot us by the word of truth. There's the same thought coming through. We came to life. We were born again. How? By the gospel, by the word of truth that was preached unto us. And Peter makes it even more clear when he says to us that we have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, listen, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. I, I can nearly end the sermon right there. You want proof? You want proof of the gospel's power? Well, here it is. How were you born again? You heard the gospel. And the power of God was in the gospel. And that was incorruptible seed. And that incorruptible seed was, 
was the means, the gospel, that the Lord used to create new life in your soul, to regenerate you. And friends, today, listen, we've all got loved ones and friends and family members that are outside of Christ. And we've wept over them, and we've pleaded with them, and we've entreated them, and we've preached all kinds of stuff at them. But listen, let's come back to the realization that the only thing that is going to bring life into their dead souls is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is powered to regenerate. Romans 1.16 tells us this. And, and this is the familiar verse of perhaps that most familiar chapter that was so precious to Martin Luther in his rediscovery of the gospel at the time of the Reformation. He says, as Paul writes to the Roman believers, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, for therein the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, for it is written, the just shall live by faith. Paul says, I'm not ashamed. In other words, rather than being ashamed, he's actually glorying in this, preaching this message, boasting in this message. I'm not ashamed, I boast in the gospel of Christ. For why? It's the power of God to salvation. Could I pause to say something which I've said many times from this pulpit, which needs to be repeated in my ears and in yours again and again. He says it's the power of God unto salvation. Notice he did not say it is the power of God unto conversion. Oh, it is that, of course. But you see, this word salvation is bigger than the word conversion, isn't it? Salvation is, we, we are being saved. And one day we are going to be saved eventually from the very presence of sin. But in this present life, we, we are being saved day by day. And what is the power of God unto that salvation of oh, believers? It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. If there was no other verse to establish beyond all doubt that believers, that Christians need to hear the gospel, it's Romans 1.16. Because it's not just the power of God to conversion. It's not just the gospel that gets you through the door. It's the gospel that gets you through your life. That's why we need to hear it over and over and over again. In Colossians, quoting again the Apostle Paul and all of these, Corinthians, Romans, Colossians, chapter 1 and verse 6, verse 5, for the sake of connection, if you're taking notes, Colossians 1, 5, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing as it does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth. What is this gospel doing? Paul says to these Colossians who heard the gospel, who believed the gospel, who were born again through the gospel, he says this gospel is, listen, it's bearing fruit and increasing among you. It is the gospel, you see, friends, this morning, not only by which we are born again, but it is the gospel through which we grow, having been born again. Isn't this the reasoning of Paul to the Galatians? Chapter 3 of Galatians, as he reasoned with them about going to another gospel. And Mark, Mark, you, that which they were going to was was not denying salvation by grace through faith in Jesus. They would have still maintained that, but they were adding to that the necessity of the law, specifically the necessity of observing the Mosaic rite of, of circumcision. Paul said that's another gospel. It's not Jesus plus something else. Even if that something else belonged to the law of God, because it is the gospel and not the law that saves us. Christ and Christ alone. And it is the gospel by which we grow and we bear fruit, as Paul says here in Colossians 1. And Galatians, he says this to them, Having begun in the Spirit, are you near now made perfect by the flesh? And if, every, if Paul is saying anything, he is saying this, 
He's saying, as you started, where did you begin? You began when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. That's the way you go on. Or to put it in another text here in Galatians, as you have received the Lord Jesus Christ, walk in him. You never get, you're never to get your eyes of Christ. You're never to get your eyes of Christ and, and him crucified. As we were reminded at the Lord's table this morning, for you. He's all for you. What he did for you. What he is, he is for you. Let me just hurry on. The proof of the gospel's power. What is the product of the gospel's power? Well, we've already talked about the fact that it produces spiritual life. But to even be more specific, it produces faith. It produces faith. How are men and women going to come to faith? They need to hear the gospel. Upon what scripture would I ground that assertion? Romans chapter 10. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. As Christians every day we find ourselves in what Paul called, as he wrote to Timothy, the good fight of faith. Now we can take that verse of scripture and, and try to tease it apart in many ways, but among other things that are indicated to us in that expression, the good fight of faith, it is not only faith by which we fight sin and faith by which we fight Satan, but faith itself has to fight. In other words, we are always prone to and battling against unfaith or if you like unbelief we never get away at least I don't know about you maybe you've got to the place where you don't need to pray Lord I believe help my unbelief but I do and I venture to say that's your experience too help my unbelief why because faith is under attack and it is the goal of Satan to weaken that faith if he cannot destroy it he will seek to weaken it and how therefore is that faith to be strong? How is it to grow? Well, by the same means through which it came into existence in the first place. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the word of God. And if it is through that word, read by us, heard by us, studied by us, that the Spirit of God produces faith in our souls, a faith which is, is growing, as Paul said to the, to the Thessalonians, that one of the reasons why he praised God for them and rejoiced before God as he prayed was that their faith was growing exceedingly. Friends, this morning, listen, if faith is to grow, and, and listen, if, if, if if faith doesn't grow, then, as we shall see in a moment or two, other, these other virtues that grace produces in the soul will not grow either, then we have to go back to that through which God increases our faith. And what is that? The Word of God, the Word of Christ, the Word of the Gospel. And with that faith that, that the Word of God produces, there will be joy. 1 Thessalonians 1.16 where Paul again recounting the first experiences that he had with the people in Thessalonia. He said concerning them that they received the word, yes, but they received the word with joy. That's why we say it's good news. That's why when we were during the Advent period, we heard over and over and over again the words of the angel to the shepherds of Bethlehem glad tidings of great joy the gospel you see is is a word of of news that is good it's joyful news you've often sung the hymn haven't you we have heard the joyful sound jesus saves listen my friends this morning if a word that brings to us the promise of forgiveness if a word that brings to us the promise of freedom if a word that brings to us a promise of fullness, if a word that brings to us a promise of a future does not bring joy, what possibly can? And the gospel does all of that. Proclaiming forgiveness through his name. Said this morning, like with laser focus, 
The Bible sets before us this truth over and over and over again, which God calls upon his ministers to proclaim to men and women the forgiveness of sins. You know, if you haven't got forgiveness, what else matters? Thank God that through this man, the apostle said, has preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, the forgiveness of all sins, the forgiveness of the worst of sins. How we rejoice to state as believers our confidence. The Apostles' Creed makes it clear, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah. That's what the gospel says to us. And it's in Christ and in Him alone. And the gospel, as we saw some weeks ago, of freedom. That God delivers us from the power or domain of darkness, translates us into the kingdom of his dear son. A gospel which we said is a fullness. It's like to a feast in scripture where God says, come on, eat, be satisfied, be filled. And a gospel that gives us a future, a hope in heaven laid up for us eternally. That's why it is good news of great joy. So it produces faith, it produces joy, it produces love. How can it be otherwise? Because what does the gospel tell us, among other things? As it sets before us Christ and Him crucified, it tells us that God loves us. He tells us that He so loved us that He gave His only begotten Son for us. And God has manifested this love toward us in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is the effect of hearing and believing the love that the Father has, before, has had for us? We love Him. Because he first loved us. The great commandment of the law, brethren and sisters, is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Listen, nobody can do that without the gospel. Remember when Luther was struggling? And he says, love God. He says, I hate it. Because all he could hear was words of condemnation and words of command that he could never fulfill. All he could think about was law, 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 law. But then he heard the gospel. And he realized that God had given to him in Jesus Christ a great gift of forgiveness. And that natural animosity that is characteristic of all of us in our fallen state, now give way to a love which was begotten and fed by a truth that God loved us, gave his son for us, gave himself to us. And a peace. Peace is also produced. What does the gospel produce? Faith, joy, love, peace. Acts chapter 10, the apostle again talks about preaching peace by Jesus Christ. Paul talked in Romans 15, 13 about joy and peace in believing. And believing what? Believing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we get in our souls the message this morning that you and I as Christians need to hear this gospel as much as the unconverted. That leads me to my final thought. The proof of the gospel's power, the product of the gospel's power, the practice of the gospel's power. You see, when the heart of man, hitherto dead in sin, is given new life, begotten again, born again through the, through the word of God, <coughs> through the preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and when in that believing the heart knows the experience of love and joy and peace, which, by the way, are the fruits of the Spirit, through believing the gospel, there has to be an obvious effect with all of that. And that effect, something that is true and visible in all of our lives, to some degree and measure. What does it produce, practically? Well, in general, the scripture describes the way in which we should live. In one statement given by the Lord Jesus, as a summary of the law of God, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, 
and your labor and your neighbor as yourself. Can't do it without the gospel. It is the gospel that leads me to love the Lord because I realize through that gospel that he first loved me. And what is more, I cannot love others until I know that I have been loved. Read a little book some time ago by Max Licato on uh, 1 Corinthians. It talks about the definition of love. You know the chapter there that is given and all the characteristics of, of, of love. One of the points that he makes in the beginning, he says, and I think it's important for us to realize this, he says, you cannot give out love if you're not taking it in. And the love that is spoken of in 1 Corinthians in chapter 13 is seen in all of its fullness and perfection in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ proclaimed to us in the gospel. I mean, you've only got to go through the characteristics of love that are mentioned there. Put your name in where the word love occurs and ask yourself, is it true? It says, love is kind. Well, could I say David is kind? <laughs> I wish I could. At least all the time. He goes on to say, love does this and love does that and love does it. Put your name in and say, is this me? And you have to say, no, it's not me. But put the name of Jesus in. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not give, keep a record of wrongs. And it's that love that we take in. That's what we hear in the gospel over and over and over again. And you know what it does? It enables us not only to love him, it enables us to love others. Jesus Christ's love. And this is what we preach in the gospel. Jesus Christ's love is the model, it's the motivation, and it is the measure of our love to others. That's, 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 gen that's the general pr uh, practice or what is produced in our practice by the gospel. We could bring it down from the generality to the particular. I'll just give you three uh, points on that, just, just to mention them. It's interesting, you see, that we've been talking about the practical power of the gospel and how it is the gospel that provides for us the motivation and it is the gospel that, in Jesus Christ that shows us the measure of how we are to love others. There are three things in Scripture at least, I'm just taking three, in which the scriptures make it clear that it is the gospel that provides the model and the motivation for us. You take something as practical as marriage. You want, you want practical preaching? Well, talk about marriage. That's very practical, isn't it? The relationship of a husband to a wife. The Apostle Paul speaks of it in the book of Ephesians and he talks about the, the role of the husband, the role of the wife, and the responsibility of the husband to the wife, and the wife the husband, and so on. But what I want to get to you this morning is this. Notice how Paul, in speaking of such a practical subject as marriage, and the roles in marriage, attaches it to the gospel. Because what does he say? He says, husbands, love your wives. There's the practical. And he says this, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might wash her, the washing of water by the word, and so on and so forth. See how the subject is practical at marriage, how the gospel comes in. If we preach on those subjects without the gospel, we might as well just, just be, as it were, social workers giving humanistic ideas. But well, this very practical Christian living is indispensably linked to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Think about another very practical subject, money. And how we're to use money. And how we, we're to use it for the glory of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, or, or chapter 8 and verse 2 and following you get a lot of Paul is talking about money and, 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 and the generosity with which Christians are to be characterized. But as he speaks in a subject as practical as money, he cannot divorce that again from the gospel. 
Because he says to them, as he urges them to generosity, in the giving of their money, he says this, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. And so when he's speaking about money, he's talking about Christ again and what he did for us, the gospel. Take, about, take something like the, the Christian virtue of meekness. How does a Christian become meek? Meekness, of course, was the great characteristic of our Savior in the days of his flesh. He said in Matthew 11, I am meek and lowly in heart. And as Paul preaches to the Philippians the necessity of meekness, what does he do in order that they might have a model and a motivation? He preaches to them the gospel again. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he talked about his steps down. And how he stepped down and being in the form of God. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and was found in fashion as a man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And he's preaching on Christian meekness. But notice how he points to Christ and the gospel and all of that. What's the application of all of this, beloved, this morning? If all of this is true, if the gospel has power, if the gospel is productive, if the gospel is practical, then surely, surely, I and you need to soak our souls in the gospel. We need to do it very deliberately, and we need to do it daily. The great statement of Luther again, I need to hear the gospel every day, he said, because I forget it every day. One of our greatest and perhaps most destructive tendencies, even though we are believers, is that we suffer from gospel amnesia, we forget it. And that means that every day I need to use the means that God has put at my disposal to remind myself of it and to explore the depths of it. Because never forget, men and women, when we get to glory, it's the gospel that will still be the theme of our song. What are they singing in heaven? Not to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. How do I explore the depths of it? How do I seek to soak my soul in it? Well, I need to hear it over and over and over again. My responsibility to you and before God is that in every sermon I bring you to the feet of the Lord Jesus again and all that he has done for you. The sacraments, too, are given to us to remind us of the gospel. Sacrament of baptism. Remember what Paul said to the Galatians. He says, you're baptized into Christ. He said to the Romans, you're baptized into his death. There's the gospel. This morning at the Lord's table again, the gospel was portrayed before us. We were declaring the Lord's death to our own souls and to all who would witness. In sermons and sacraments and singing, oh, let our songs, let our songs be chock full of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Praise the Lord. Amen.